And hopefully this is the same live as that's here. This is weird. Let me see if I can find on YouTube right now that we're live. Let me look on my other monitor. I can do that. It says somebody says nothing yet. Okay. So it's just a black screen. Okay, I'm watching live on my on my computer and I'm on my iPad. So on my iPad we're going live. Uh Okay, so people say that. Uh, that's weird. Oh, I'm hearing gonna... and seeing. I see both of you. Okay, praise the Lord. All right. I don't see the right thumbnail, though. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see us on the screen, though. So I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Uh, Someone says they see us on YouTube now. I don't know where. Oh, here it is, right here. Yep, it's Soothkeep. I didn't put a thumbnail on it. I, I'll have to add the thumbnail later. Okay, but uh, I I don't see. All I see is a black screen on mine. So. Yep. Oh yeah, it's the it's a different one. Um, it, I refreshed it and it showed up, so I think we're good now. Okay, what's the link for YouTube then? The link for YouTube, I'll send it to you. So sorry. Yeah, no worries. I think the devil's just having a heyday here. Yeah, but it's coming to an end for him. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, let me get that link for you. Ah, what's that? No, that's not it. Okay, so yeah, send me the link. And it's in email. I just sent it. Okay. There you go. All right. So uh, as far as I can tell, it looks like we're getting some thumbs up and people are saying that they can see us and hear us. So I am very thankful for that. Had more trouble tonight than I have had in all the times I've done live streams and YouTube videos. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, but praise the Lord. This is part of spiritual warfare. This is part of battle. This is really not against flesh and blood. This is against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And it doesn't matter uh, what aspect of Christianity you're going to touch. You're going to have spiritual warfare. But some of them, there's more spiritual warfare than others. And one of those is the Word of God. And the other one is the is nation and people of Israel. Yeah. All right, folks. So here is the introduction. Most of you already know who Olivier Melnick is. Dear, dear brother, Messianic believer in Yeshua. He is a part of the Chosen People Ministries. He's the Southwest Regional Director. He's got a tremendous heart for the gospel. He loves Bible prophecy, and he is well known for addressing issues of anti-Semitism, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. Well, with no further ado, we're going to get right into the show since we've already lost a half hour to the shenanigans of our enemy. So, brother, yes. my first question. Recently, the question came up about what was the biggest prophetic event in 2023. And most of the people that answered the question said, oh, that's easy. It's October 7th. I surprised a few of them because I said, nope, that's the second biggest issue in the last year. In my mind, the biggest issue is the anti-Semitism that has exploded since that day and is running through the world like a tsunami. I'd like to hear your take on this issue. Well, I, I agree with you. The the the, the, the war, uh, the uh, terrorist attack of, of October seven, and followed by the war that that Israel uh, is still in the middle of right now, uh, set the stage for the biggest event. Just like uh, it, it, it had to happen 
to to unleash anti-Semitism like we haven't seen. I mean, uh, the, the the events of October seven, uh, it was the uh, it, it definitely was the uh, the uh, heaviest death toll, Jewish death toll since the Holocaust. Uh, but uh, what, what's amazing to me, Lee, is how so many people around the globe, not just in Israel, around the globe, and certainly in America, have become very uh, emboldened by by the events and are just coming out of the woodworks and are declaring their anti-Semitism uh, w- with no shame. You know, people used to you know, say, well, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist or I'm anti-Israel or I'm anti-colonialism. Now they're declaring their anti-Semitism with no shame. And I think, as, as I mentioned in, in a conference that you and I attended uh, a month ago, uh, the beast is, is 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 out of the box, and and I don't think there's any putting it back now. I think that uh, uh, you and I are both, uh, you know, uh, we we look at the rapture as the next event on the on the prophetic uh, uh, timeline, but we know that things can get a lot worse before the rapture, and I think that's where we are we're seeing right now. We're seeing this anti-Semitism uh, going from from coming from all directions, from the right, from the left, from the atheists, from from academia, from Hollywood. From from Muslims, from uh, from the church, even and, yeah, and it's not going to stop. It is not going to stop. Uh, Christians need to be aware that not only it's not going to stop, but uh, uh, the Jews are the appetizers on on uh, Satan's uh, uh, menu. He is going after Christians next. I th- I think you're right, and in it might sound pessimistic in many ways. But as I look about what's going on, the direction things are going, the anti-Semitism issue is not going to improve. We're not going to be able to engage in geopolitical uh, endeavors. We're not going to be able to engage in political endeavors. We're not going to be able to get the UN to make a few changes that's going to fix this problem. This is a satanic problem. The whole world is controlled by the devil. So I'm, oh, man. Uh, I don't even hardly know what to say. It, it's it's painful to see this kind of evil in the world. It it, it is a satanic. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, let me start with this, Lee. Let me give uh, your audience my definition of anti-Semitism because that's going to be very helpful. I think. Uh, I again, I you know, it, it, and I've, I've said, I've mentioned that many times. I have a lot of books on that topic it's 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 my wheelhouse it's what i talk about so i have several hundred books on on the topic of the holocaust and anti-semitism and uh i have yet to find one book that really addresses the issue from the right perspective and that perspective is spiritual warfare this Mm. is why my definition of anti-semitism and i'm not saying it's the best but i i think that's the one that works the best for me is that anti-semitism and listen to those two keywords anti-semitism is the irrational and satanic hatred of the jewish people in israel characterized by thoughts words and deeds against them but the keywords are irrational and satanic if you understand that satan is beyond anti-semitism is the creator of anti-semitism then you understand it's it's a spiritual warfare you understand you're dealing with fighting the enemy and we know the end of the story he's not going to win but if he can take casualties he will and the reason why lee uh, since you didn't ask me i'll tell you the reason why is because satan knows that at the end of the seven-year tribulation the Jews are corporately going to call on Yeshua, on Jesus. And they're going to say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's when Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back, Satan goes into retirement. And he doesn't want to go into retirement because he knows where he's going. He doesn't want to go in the lake of fire. But that's what he's destined for. And that's going to happen no matter what. If he can stop the Jews from calling on Yeshua, and calling on the one who they have pierced, Je- uh, Zechariah 12.10, then his job is secure. He stays in his position. Jesus is not coming back, and he rules the world like he's ruling right now. Amen. And I am so looking forward to the day when the Lord comes back and fixes the sin problem, removes the uh, not only the devil, but all of his henchmen, all the fallen angels, all the fallen spirits, whatever there is out there in that evil mix, they are gone. 
Amen. Amen. But now, we're not there yet. That's right. Now, here's an interesting question. I've heard people make comments that they justify what appears to me to be anti-Semitism because they say, um, well, the Lord might be dealing with the Jews in the future, but the present nation of Israel, this is not a godly nation. The government's not godly. And they just want to go down that path and justify anti-Semitism. And, and they, they say, well, you guys that are defending Israel, you're defending your sin. And what would you say to that? I would say to them, read your Bible. <laughs> because the, uh, the, is, the nation of Israel is the nation of Israel without sin. Of course not. Are Christians without sin? No, we're not. We're just forgiven. We're redeemed by the blood of Yeshua. But we still have the sin nature. Israel is not without sin, but Israel is in God's plan. Why? Because going back to Genesis 12, God made a covenant with Abraham. And he gave him a promise in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 15, he ratified that promise into a covenant, which is unconditional and eternal. Unconditional, last time I checked, doesn't have any conditions. In other words, it is not based on Israel's performance. It is not based on any performance that any Jew in the world in the history of the Jewish people could do. It is only based on God's character. God who promised that he was going to make that covenant with, the, with, with Abraham and his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and through the 12 tribes, and to be a blessing to the whole world. And that's an unconditional promise only based on God's character. So if Israel is in sin, if some Jewish people are believers and some are not, it doesn't matter. It does not take away the fact that God said, I will keep my word. And it they, it does not get Jewish people saved as I made that choice 40 years ago to invite Yeshua, Jesus, into my heart so that he would become my savior. And from that point on, I'm saved and I have eternal life in the presence of God, and, and I, I have that secured. So the, the Abrahamic covenant does not get Jewish people saved, but it promises that he, he promises that he's never going to renege on Israel. He reconfirms that in Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37. He says he's not going to he's not going to destroy Israel no matter what. And uh, so people that said that we are uh, we are supporting Israel in sin, no, we are biblically supporting. A people group and and, and 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 a piece of land that God has promised would never go away. We just have to uh, understand that Israel is not perfect in in many ways, but it Israel is not going away. The Jewish people are not going away because they are part of God's plan all the way to the end. Amen. What I like to tell people is, is hey, when the Lord came to His people the first time and they nationally rejected Him, He took the remnant that believed and He went off and he, he dealt with the Gentiles. But that was prophesied, that window of time where he was going to go to the Gentiles and gather in people for a name to himself under the Gentiles was prophesied. And when the Lord comes back, he has to start with Israel right where he found them. He's going to pick up with the nation in their unbelief and bring them through whatever he has to bring them through till the nation believes. And Absolutely. Man, it just to me, it's so clear in the scriptures. I don't understand how people don't tremble at those passages of scripture. Well, I find that usually the people that uh, the people that 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 look at Israel uh, from a different perspective very often either believe or have been influenced by replacement theology. Oh, absolutely. And, and for, the, for those who are listening uh, to the show, replacement theology is a false doctrine that uh, teaches that the church has replaced Israel, thus the word replacement, replaced Israel in God's plan. And so that all the blessings that God promised in the Abrahamic covenant and forward to Israel are now uh, given to the church. But you'll notice that in replacement theology, the church gets all the blessings, but the Jews can keep the curses. Oh, I know. Isn't that unfair? <laughs> it's inconsistent. But you know what's interesting? Error is always inconsistent. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, we talked, touched on this a little bit earlier when we touched on spiritual warfare. 
But you brought out a point which I think people absolutely need to understand that this issue here is more than just a doctrinal yay or a doctrinal nay. This is a, a spiritual issue. And so where does, just take a few minutes and trace anti-Semitism from its beginning to the present day? Well, from the, the beginning, again, it's it, it's coming from, it's uh, you're asking me to answer a question in a couple of minutes, which, by the way, I usually do in a seminar that lasts 25 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's going to be good. 25 hours in two minutes. Whoa. No challenge there. <laughs> um, and you, going back to the fact that Satan is at the root, at the core of, of anti-Semitism, we, uh, we see it go through the ages uh, 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 and, and morphing and changing, but it's the same goal that Satan has to get rid of the Jews, eradicate Israel, get rid of the Jews. I mean, you look at today when people say, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine shall be free. The vast majority of the people saying this on the streets in America and somewhere in the world and on all the, the university campuses, they have no clue what they're saying, but they're basically calling for the genocide of, of the Jews. Uh, yeah. So yeah. to this day, Satan is pushing the same agenda that he started pushing uh, 2,000 years ago. And uh, we, there is a progression uh, the, 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 at its origins, anti-Semitism, you know, from uh, after the closing of the canon, uh, we, we have examples of anti-Semitism in the Bible. Of course, you've got the Pharaoh who, who didn't know Joseph. You've got Haman in the book of, uh, book of Esther. You've got the Amalekites. All those different examples of the enemies of Israel uh, with, with some, some really good examples of, of the hatred of the Jews just because they were Jews. But then it continues. It, and when you look at the early church fathers, and I know you're, you're an expert on the church fathers, so uh, we, uh, you and I have threatened that maybe we'll write something together on that topic. But uh, uh, the early church fathers uh, started to look at scripture in a way uh, sometimes that was uh, too allegorical and that, 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 that became the, 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 the catalyst for what you could call theological anti-Judaism, the beginning of, of the whole process. And then through the, uh, the, the, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, uh, it continued to develop, and then some laws were written, like the Justinian Code and the Theodician Code. I'm sure you're familiar with those two. And uh, and then it, it started to uh, 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 structure a, a, a body of, of a legal body to protect the Christians and to ostracize the Jews, to separate the two communities. And the Christians, completely uneducated, basically listened to what their leaders were saying. So it 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 further. Uh, drove a, a wedge between the uh, the Jews and the Christians to the point of, and I'm really doing 25 hours in two minutes, to the point of uh, anti-Semitism becoming, you know, coming through the, the Crusades and the Inquisition and then the pogroms and the, uh, uh, the, the, the Reformation with Luther. And, and I can touch on any of those if you're interested, but I'm just passing through. And then right. we get to the Holocaust. We get to the Holocaust. And that was, that is when anti-Semitism became racial anti-Semitism, which of course it's not, but Hitler pushed the racial card, you know, through the, 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 the promoting of this false pseudoscience known as eugenics. And, uh, and he was very successful. Six million of them died, in, including my, my own grandfather who uh, perished in Auschwitz. So it's very personal to me. And then for a couple of decades, People were like, okay, anti-Semitism is over. It's like it's it's a taboo subject, you know. After the war, nineteen so 1945 through the early 60s, mid 60s, it was not too much of an issue. It was, but in reality, it was swept under the carpet, and nobody wanted to talk about it. And then it resurfaced as the new anti-Semitism. It started to be pushed by Yasser Arafat in the Middle East, and it's when the new anti-Semitism took the victims and the perpetrators and switched roles. So now the perpetrators have become the victims, thus the poor Palestinians, displaced people, uh, occupied by Israel, the perpetrators, the new Nazis of the Middle East. And you add to that what we've seen in the last 12 years, to be exact, but that's my opinion, uh, since 2012, the uh, end times anti-Semitism, which well, that's what I call end times anti-Semitism. That's where we are right now. Part of the new anti-Semitism, where Jews are being killed again, not just in Israel, in the whole world, in France, 
in Pittsburgh, San Diego, uh, Paris, you've seen Jews being killed. And that's part of the end times anti-Semitism. There's just one more after this. That's um, uh, tribulation anti-Semitism, when according to Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, two thirds of the Jews will die and one third will survive. That was more than two minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, that no, that's fine. It was a it was a great outline. I would point out to folks if you heard the word pogrom, which he mentioned, uh, and you don't know what it means, Olivier, can you just take uh, and explain very briefly what the pogroms were? <coughs> pogroms is what my great grandmother Rachel Shimkovitz uh, fled. A pogrom. If any of you watching right now. Uh, if you remember the movie that most people have seen or the play that people have seen, Fiddler on the Roof, that is the story of a little shtetl, a little village in Eastern Europe. And, and then when the Cossacks go after the Jews and, and kill them and rape the women and, and, and steal the children to put them in labor camps and, or to deprogram them and kill the husbands, that's the pogrom. The pogrom means a riot. It means an organized riot by the police and the army or both. And so uh, they, they, they started in the, in the 1800s, and that's what pushed the Jews of Eastern Europe, the Ashkenazi Jews, to flee and to go to America, to Canada, to back then what was called Palestine, which had, that's a different topic altogether, you know, Israel and, uh, and France and, and Western Europe. I talk a lot about this, uh, this the, by the way, this whole uh, historical outline of anti-Semitism, the 25 hour I just mentioned in this book to to, to plug one of my books here, uh, End Times Anti-Semitism, there's the whole history in this. It's the biggest book that I've written. And uh, all my books are on Amazon, by the way. Uh, so that book will give a lot of the details of the history with quotes from people and a lot of uh, a lot of information. Now, I found it fascinating. You talked about this role reversal where in the eyes of the world, the, uh, the Jews are the evil people and and the Palestinians are the ones that are being downtrodden by the mean old Jews. Now, there, there's something interesting about this, and maybe you can take us down this path for a minute or two. There's, there is, you can't demonstrate that the Palestinian people that are in the Gaza Strip right now, for instance, actually have a genetic connection to the land. It's my understanding that these people are almost entirely of Arabic descent. They're Arabs. And they've come from mostly from Egypt and Jordan and a few other Middle Eastern nations. They're not really from that area. They're not. Uh, I saw a meme on uh, on the social networks a little while ago. It was a bunch of people standing in a large hall with white walls everywhere, and the title said "The uh, Museum of Palestinian History," and it was white walls everywhere. <laughs> Because I, you know, I'm not trying to make fun of the Palestinians. They need Jesus, just like anybody, any any other lost soul. They need Jesus. But the Palestinian narrative. That's why I said earlier. You know, when my great grandmother had she moved in the late 1800s instead of France, where we were born, had she moved to Israel back then, she would have moved to Palestine. Because until 1948, Palestine described a body of. A, a geographical mass, a body of, of land, it did not describe a people. You know, back then it was Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Arabs. And the Palestinian um, uh, flag today is almost identical, except for that little star that it doesn't have in that triangle, almost identical to the Jordanian flag. Hmm. But let me show you something. I should have had this on my desk here. It, this is fascinating to me. If you look at this 1939 dictionary from France, known as the Petit, Petit Larousse, which is in 1939, it was the 290th edition. So this, this dictionary goes back a long time, okay? The, the first, the first uh, uh, issue of this dictionary is older than America, okay? So in 1939, this dictionary came out and they have the flags. And I, I'll show you on the screen right here. You've got the German flag. Hold on, let me let me make sure. Okay, you see the German flag right here? Yep. 1939, under it, it says Allemagne, French for Germany. 1939, obviously, it's Nazi Germany. So it would have to be that flag. But here's something that's absolutely mind boggling. Here's the Palestinian flag. Oh yeah. 
This is not what you see today. This That's is a right. blue and white square with a yellow star of David. Why is that? Because Palestine is Israel. And back then, nobody cared. And all those uh, people that have not that are not have become Palestinian refugees are simply Arabs from Jordan, from Jordan, from Lebanon, from Syria, from Egypt, from 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 all those countries around Israel that lived in quote unquote Palestine back then, and then they became they were forced to stay, and that was the the agenda that Arafat started. Uh, they were forced to stay. And they were they, they were they were forced to become refugees. And then they had kids, and their kids had kids. And now we're two generations removed. And you have Palestinians born in the Palestinian territories who don't know that they're actually Jordanians or Lebanese, or they, they don't know. They they might know, but they don't talk about it because they have to be Palestinians for the agenda to work. Hmm. Well, it's definitely a spiritual battle. It, it's amazing when you talk about these issues with people that profess to be Christians or they're conservative or left wing and they don't really understand the issues. Uh, it's just amazing to see the blindness and the hardness against the facts. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's, you know, I, I, I talk, what, what really saddens me, Lee, is, is, uh, the church's attitude, and not all the churches, but a lot of people in uh, in the church today are uh, they, they're not interested in the facts, uh, especially the young people. The young people are they're they're clueless. They're clueless, and and uh, I'm uh, I'm seeing what I'm seeing right now is that this anti-Semitism that's out of the box that's going rampant all over the world. Uh, it's going to get worse before the rapture. It's going to get a lot worse. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Uh, I think that Christians now, Christians and, and people of goodwill, not just Christians, but, you know, we, we, we address mostly a Christian audience. Uh, uh, Christians will have a chance to, the best way I can put it is redeem the past by acting in the present to alter the future. Amen. I like that. And in, in, what I mean by redeeming the past is there's a lot of mistakes made during the Second World War and during the whole history of, of Christianity uh, and, and Jewish relations. But uh, but looking back at the war and the Holocaust, the Second World War and the Holocaust, there were a lot of mistakes made and a lot of people became bystanders. They just went like, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can get involved. So they just looked the other way and... Uh, I don't know if you remember the movie that I showed at the uh, pre-trib with the, uh, the, uh, the the little German church and the train and uh, but um, uh, you know it's uh, maybe we can put a link to that in your, uh, in your on your on your YouTube channel because it's it's very sobering. But uh, Christians today uh, have a chance to redeem the past by doing something right now. And what is it? What they can do is and th this is Lee. This has been on my heart for uh, uh for a while now i see a time coming where christians are going to have an opportunity to open their hearts and open their homes to shelter rescue and shelter jewish people amen i i think we're getting there and uh if i may um i have a uh, a connection with a network of people of like-minded uh, christians who are willing to open their homes and i know there are people listening to your show uh, that are going to be in that category. So uh, 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 there is uh, um, there is a, a simple link that they can follow to sign up to to say, hey, I want to be in that network. Send me some information, and if they can just go, if I may say, if I may say this, on can I can I share that? With yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's 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 bridges to Zion. Bridges like a bridge. Bridges number two Zion. Bridges to Zion dot com bridges to zion.com if they type this they will get a simple little form they can fill out uh, securely online and then they tell us you know why are they heard from this and what they want to do and and there's no we're not asking for money we're not raising money we're, we actually it's very private very secure uh we find out what people want to do and it's simply a um a network of like-minded 
Christians like you and I who would say like, you know, if a Jewish family is in need, my house can be a place of refuge. And mm -hmm. I think we're getting to, we're getting to that place uh, need, and Christians, Christians need to understand that. I think that one of the challenge and that would be maybe my final, uh, final thought. I mean, I don't know if we are, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, well, we started late. So if you don't mind going a little late, that's fine with me. But if okay. you got it, uh, I, I, I can I, I can go a little, a little longer, but so that won't that will not be my final thought. That will be an additional thought. Uh, uh, the uh, Christians have who love Israel today, and this might rough, ruffle some feathers. Okay, so I hope people don't get mad. Uh, uh, Christians who love the Jewish people and love Israel today, they really look at Jews more theologically. And more, you know, and biblically, than humanly, yeah. they they look at Jewish people, uh, you know, in the Bible, and they know there is an Israel, there are Jewish people, but there is a human aspect. We 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 need. We are getting at a crossroads, Lee, right now with this anti-Semitism since October seventh. We're getting at a place where Christians are going to have a chance to. They're going to have a platform. They're going to have a, a captive audience. If they have Jewish people come to their home to rescue them, uh, uh, they will have a captive audience and say, listen, I have you in my home because I want to protect you because I read my Bible and God loves the Jewish people and my Messiah is Jewish. And Christians are going to have a chance to, to, to share the gospel in the midst of humanitarian effort to help the Jews. And I think that's where we are right now. And it's developing quickly and we need Christians to be ready for that. Now, this kind of leads us into another aspect of the anti-Semitism. In, in your mind, is anti-Semitism, does it spill over and get directed at Christians that support Israel or support the Jews? Uh, uh, yes, yes. It's um, anti-Semitism uh, is going after the Jews but it is so, so toxic right now that anybody, uh, and, you know, it, which is really, uh, you know, you, you're setting me up here because I'm just asking Christians to, to volunteer to open their homes for Jewish people. And now you're having me say, and it's going to be dangerous. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, not a, it's not a cakewalk. Uh, the, the end times, you know, and again, I... Let me let me reiterate that I do not believe we are in a tribulation. I do, you know, I do not believe the church will be part of the tribulation. But we are spared. Uh, we are spared from God's wrath. For, uh, scripture is clear about that. But we it doesn't say we will be spared from man's wrath. And I think right now we're going through man's wrath, and, and directed by Satan and and his uh, and his demons. Uh, so um, uh, if you love Israel, uh, you might be uh, you might be a target. Yes, if you, uh, there is a man in my neighborhood when I walk my dog, uh, I haven't seen him yet, but my wife stopped the other day because they were in front, in the front of their uh, of their house. So she stopped and, and said hi and introduced herself. He has an American flag and right under, on a big pole, and right under it he put an Israeli flag. And I thought, I got to go thank him because he's being really bold. Now, our neighborhood is, is pretty safe and it's a nice suburb of Dallas. But still, in our day and age, to put an Israeli flag in front of your house is the target. Hmm. So if you love Israel, if you love the Jews, and you should, if you read your Bible, you really should, then you should all, uh, you should be prepared uh, for persecution. But we know that persecution is going to Christians anyway. It's coming to Christians. So it might as well be for a good reason. <laughs> so be persecuted because you follow Jesus and be persecuted because you love the Jews. Those are two good, good causes. Now, one thing I've noticed is there's a growing fascination in the world with the Nazi movement, with the Nazi symbols, the Nazi salutes, the Nazi attitude. Uh, it's uh, what's going okay. on with this? Well, that's I think it's part of the it's part of the um, this rebirth of anti-Semitism as we've seen in the last couple of months where. Where everything goes right now, the Nazi symbols, the uh, the swastika and then the SS symbols and all the Nazi paraphernalia, nobody really wanted to to, to deal with that uh, uh, because it was like uh, 
it really has a really negative for good reasons, uh, connotations. So nobody wanted to associate them, th themselves with anything that had to do with the Nazi party. But but now it's it's just out of the box. Nobody cares. And this fascination. And what, what's interesting is that uh, um, the uh, the people that use those symbols, they don't even know. They're usually kids. They don't even know what they mean. And, uh, you know, I, I wish that every kid using a Nazi symbol would be given a free tour of Auschwitz. With, oh, yeah. with, with commentaries and with photos and films and 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 you know and that would that would make him think you know that would make him maybe think change their mind but uh right now the anti-semitism that we see is coming from every side it's coming from the right it's coming from the left uh uh, and you know, and then we, you, you, you and I had this, you, you, you would men you'd mentioned that uh, said that anti-Semitism would be becoming a political issue. Uh, you know, that Democrats siding with Hamas and more conservative siding with Israel. Uh, not only that, I agree, but not only that, Lee. I think that the final division in the in the end times for the church will be on their support or rejection of Israel. Yes, I agree. Well, we see this in Matthew 25, where the Lord gathers the sheep and the goats, and people think go. the, the world's divided into two classes. No, it's divided into three. The Lord's people, the sheep, and the goats. And and the sheep were those. Well, I'll let you walk him through it. Well, the, 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 you know, I, that passage is actually my uh, my inspiration for, for what I'm trying to encourage Christians to do right now. Um, because I see this passage of the sheep and the goat uh, as uh, the return of the Messiah, uh, and, and he's looking at two groups of Gentiles who were left behind, so they were not believers. They were left behind uh, after the, after the uh, the uh, the rapture. They went through the tribulation, and some helped Israel and the Jews, and some did not. The sheep uh, were helpers and rescuers, and the goats were not. And when Yeshua returns, he says to the goats, straight into the lake of fire, and to the sheep, you walk into the kingdom with me. And 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 we and they, they don't even know. They go like, what, what have we done? He said, well, you, you, you've, you've helped the Jewish people. You've given them food and drink and clothed them and sheltered them. And uh, anything you did to them, it's as if you did to me. And so... And if you didn't do to them, it's as if you didn't do to me. So he separates those two groups. And it's, 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 it's what I see this, I see it happening in the future, you know, at the end of the tribulation, based on what these Gentiles did or did not do to the Jews through the tribulation. But we could take the principle of Christians doing something to make a difference for the Jewish people and apply it today. And that's why I see that passage being a future passage, a tribulational passage, but I see the principle as possibly could be applied today. And I'm hoping that Christians will say, yes, I want to make a difference today because, because in um, Zechariah 13, 9, 8 and 9, we're told that two thirds of the Jewish people will die through the tribulation and one third will survive will be refined as silver and refined as gold and that one third is the one that looks up and says blessed is you who comes in the name of the lord and jesus returns well you know that passage always bothered me for years and then eventually my wife who's the one who led me to the lord 40 years ago my wife said olivier that passage is bad if it would happen today it would be 10 million jews dying and 5 million surviving and that would be bigger than a holocaust but then she said look at the passage again it doesn't have a number it has a percentage that will never change two one two two thirds one third but what can change it what's it's the number of people contained is the inner two third and one third the more jewish people that we share the messiah with the more jewish people who come to a saving knowledge of yeshua jesus before the tribulation will come with us as part of the body of Messiah, the church, and we're going to be a smaller number going through the tribulation. So it should be an encouraging an incentive for uh, for Christians today to be bold with their Jewish friends and their Jewish neighbors. Uh, and if they don't know how to do it, they can watch my videos on YouTube. I have a lot of teaching. They can reach out to me at newantisemitism.com, and they can reach out to me through my videos on YouTube, send me messages, 
and I'd be happy to direct them and teach them how to share the gospel with the Jewish people. I've often thought about what's uh, the amazing work of God that's going on right now in Israel with tremendous numbers of uh, Jews being saved, with Arabs being saved. The work of the Lord is going forth. You know, 20, 30 years ago, if you were in the IDF and you were a believer in Yeshua, you might not know anyone else in your same unit that was a believer in the Messiah. And now they're laced through society. Yeah, not only that, but, that, you know, we have reports uh, from Israel of, of uh, soldiers in the IDF who are believers who have actually made great progress in, in, in you know, they, they've been respected by the rest of the Jewish people in the IDF who are not believers, as I like to say, yet. Yes. Uh, uh, and and so they, they, there's a tremendous respect for Messianic Jews in Israel that are going through the IDF and 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 and, and helping in um, in in fighting the enemy. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, I the other day, uh, a, a couple of months ago, I sent an email to a local rabbi in my in, in my um, in my community, a, an Orthodox rabbi. So he definitely doesn't want to see me or talk to me because I'm a renegade, I'm a traitor, I'm a I'm not Jewish anymore in his eyes. And I sent him an email and I said, Rabbi so-and-so, my name is Olivia Melnick. I'm a Messianic believer. I believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. I know you don't believe that. And I know you probably think I'm crazy. But when it comes to anti-Semitism, you're a Jew and I'm a Jew. To the anti-Semite, we're both Jews and we're both at risk. So only on the topic of anti-Semitism, you and I should definitely agree, hold hands and work together. So if you want uh, to reach out to me, please let me know and we'll do coffee. Two hours later, he sent me an email. And then a couple of days later, we got together and we had coffee. And I saw him again since then. And we had a good conversation. So, you know, I, as a Jew, I, you know, I know I'm still Jewish. You know, my people call me a, a traitor. They, you know, you're not Jewish anymore because you believe in, 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 in Jesus, which makes no sense that's that's the, the that goes with the topic of judaism and and jewishness uh jewishness is something i was born with uh my parents were jewish i have jewish blood when i became a believer in jesus i did not have a blood transfusion it's the same blood in my veins jewish blood jewish eth ethnicity that's jewishness judaism is something you practice you lee could tomorrow start practicing judaism that would make you a jew but that would make you a proselyte to judaism that's right and and so if I don't practice Judaism, I'm still a Jew. I'm just a Jew who doesn't practice. But if I follow Jesus for some reason, I'm not Jewish anymore. That doesn't make any sense. That's nothing to do with Jewishness. But that's what my people accuse me of. Uh, th that rabbi was very kind. And he actually said, no, you're still Jewish. And you're right. Uh, on, on the topic of anti-Semitism, you and I are both the same target to the anti-Semite. So that's why I'm hoping that I can reach more Jewish people with this message because I need to let Jewish people know that uh, we need to let Jewish people know as a Christian community that the Jewish community is not alone. There are Christians today who care about Israel and who will go out of their way to, um, to, to help Jewish people and to make a difference. Um, kind of a related topic about Jews being saved in Israel, I've often thought, can you imagine what it's going to be like when there's there's so many Messianic believers in Israel now, probably almost everyone in Israel has met or known a Messianic believer, and all of a sudden the believers in Yeshua vanish from the face of the earth. And th what that's going to create all kinds of consternation and wonder um, amongst all the Jews in Israel and then the two witnesses show up and start preaching Yeshua from the Tanakh. Well, first of all, when the, when the, when the Jewish believers disappear with the rest of the believers, it's a simple answer. It's an alien abduction. That's yep. what it is, right? If it's not an alien abduction, maybe it's the rapture. Okay, yep. of course it is the rapture. Lee, I I was talking to my Jewish sister um, a while ago, who's not a believer yet, and um, uh, she's older than me and then she's, you know, she's getting up there and then, you know, her health is, you know, questionable. So she's, you know, starting to really think about her mortality, you know? And, and I told her, I said, listen, I want to tell you something. And I did not use any, any theological, uh, 
mumbo jumbo that she would go like, what are you talking about? I told her, I said, listen, I don't want you to believe what I'm saying. I don't want you to agree with what I'm saying. I don't want you to, 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 to go. I just want you to listen. Just listen. One day, a lot of people are going to disappear just like that. And whatever, whatever the news tells you, if you're still alive at that time, it's not going to be true. What's going to happen is that the Jesus I've been telling you about is going to come and get us. I didn't call it the rapture. I didn't because there was no point in making it confusing. I told her, just remember, when that happens, if you're still alive, remember, my brother was right. Jesus came to get him. And it will not be too late to turn and give your life to Jesus even back then. I would recommend you do it before. But if you do it then, it's still not too late. But remember, don't you know you get you can think I'm crazy right now, but at that time, if you're still alive, when that happens, it is not an alien abduction, it is nothing but Jesus promising to come get us, and he did, and he took us up to heaven, and there's gonna be seven years of a lot of trouble. And so I told her, and I and she said, Okay, and I said, just remember that, you know, keep it in the back of your head because it's gonna happen and probably sooner than later. Now, you mentioned about being a blessing to the Jewish people uh, and the nation and the people and nation of the of the physical nation of Israel. Uh, well, the hospitality when they come to visit in the states or when they come here for school or something. But are there what are some other ways that people can can serve? I mean, I've I, I've heard of programs like SAR L where people can go to Israel and serve for three weeks and. And pack yeah. first aid kits and we we have uh, uh, chosen people has a, a ministry called host Israelis and that is a ministry where uh, we basically uh, uh, people Jewish people that come to to, to through the USA uh, to visit to travel a, a lot of the uh, of the young Israelis after they finish school they they do some kind of a gap year when they don't really. Uh, go into the army uh, right away, so they travel and 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 they love to come to the states to go different places. And we have this, you know, uh, this ministry where they stay with people. And I, I have a, a, a friend of mine co 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 coming to my church who actually has opened his, his house and recently has a, a Jewish family right before the war started, staying with them in passing for a few days. And it's a great ministry that that is a hosting ministry, and it again gives us a chance to share the love of Messiah with Jewish uh, uh, travelers and tourists. So that's one way. Uh, you can also, uh, and we have a lot, if you go to chosenpeople.com, there's a lot of links to, to show you all the, some of the things you can do. Uh, you can go there and do a, 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 a travel to Israel to do more of a service tour when you can uh, uh, help uh, you know, with uh, Holocaust survivors or food banks or, and we do some of that through Chosen People Ministries. Uh, that's not the only one, but that's, you know, we, we do some of those things. There's plenty of things you can do to help. Also, uh, a, a funny a, a funny way is that, you know, people can support Israel by buying Israeli products. And we hear a lot, um, uh, you're familiar with it, I am too, and a lot of people don't even know what it means, BDS. Boycott, divestment, and sanction, which is yeah. a, a movement that is uh, re that was reborn in 2005, uh, but it, it's it's older than that, much older than that. But it's pushing the idea that we should boycott anything Israeli to cripple the Israeli economy, so they will actually make changes in in uh, 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 in the way they handle everything they do, which they're we're told everything that Israel does is wrong. So the BDS movement is saying you should not buy Israeli products, you should not listen to Israeli music, Israeli movies, and, you know, people that support Israel should be boycotted as well. And so what they do is they have this website and they, they uh, it's boycott, uh, it's a bdsmovement.org and you go there and they have a whole list of all the stuff that you should boycott because they're Israeli products. So I tell my friends and I tell people when I visit churches all the time, go to bdsmovement.org. I don't support what they're doing, but they've already done the homework on all the products that you should not buy because they support Israel. And that's exactly what you can buy. So the enemies of Israel have done the homework for us to know what we can purchase to support the economy. That's that's amazing. Praise the Lord. Some Isn't it amazing how the devil often outdoes himself? This reminds me of that verse in uh, in uh, Genesis 50, 20. 
and I can't quote it, you know, I, 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 I can't quote the exact verse, but that's when Joseph tells his brother that what you meant for evil, God turned into good. Amen. And God will do that whenever appropriate for his, for his program. Well, I got a couple more questions I want to catch before we move into the Q&A. Um, can you comment on Romans eleven twenty eight? As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Well, uh, uh, Ro Romans Romans divide uh, Romans nineteen eleven. We can divide it into you know three chapters, and each one has the main theme. Like nine is is election. 10 is rejection, 11 is uh, uh, salvation, if you want. Uh, in Romans 11, we read about, uh, uh, we read about the, 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 the salvation of the Jewish people. And right now, the Jewish people are rejecting the gospel, uh, but, but God has not rejected, rejected them in his grand plan for mankind. Uh, again, it's not saving Jewish people. Being a Jew, just a Jew, does not guarantee you're going to be saved. If that was the case, then uh, 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 John 3, 1 through 15 uh, would be a lie. And that's the, the part when Nicodemus, a uh, member of the Sanhedrin, a rabbi, goes to Yeshua at night and he says, I'm super Jew, I'm saved, right? And that's, he doesn't call himself super Jew, but that's what he implies. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and Jesus says, no, you need to be born of water, first birth, the, the, the human birth, and born of the spirit, regeneration you know, born again. And so even for the Jewish people, it's the same way. So that will come for right now, there is an antagonism to the gospel. And, and the reason, and one of the reasons why, uh, first of all, the, the Bible says that the Jewish, the Jews will have blinders on their eyes for a time, but, but Satan has, has been very good at, at uh, making the gospel a difficult thing to accept uh, for Jewish people, because Jewish people think that when you believe in Jesus, you lose your identity. And to Jewish people throughout our whole history, identity is equal to survival. If we keep our identity, we will survive as a people. Of course, we survive as a people because God promised he would never allow for our destruction. But to the Jewish people, spiritual or not spiritual, we survive as a people from a human perspective because we have our identity and the way we speak, the way we dress, the way we say our prayers, and we have survived that way because, by God's grace. Uh, but the Jewish people think if we lose our identity, we cease to exist. That is why it's a, the greatest fear that Jewish people have is that so many of them are going to become believers in Jesus and lose their identity, and then we cease to exist. But we don't lose our identity. I have never felt more Jewish than since I believe in my Jewish Messiah. Amen. Now, where is anti-Semitism leading? I mean, we can see it in Scripture. It's going to build up in the last days. Can you comment on that? <clears throat> well, it's it's we've we've talked about it in your program, uh, uh, you know, for for the last hour now, where it's leading to Satan's attempt at completely destroying the Jews, so that he will have his job secure. And he will not, uh, he will not go into the lake of fire, which is his final destination for all eternity, torment without relief. Uh, so it's leading to more, uh, more uh, rejection and more turmoil for the Jewish people. Uh, and um, it's, it, I don't know how much time we have before the rapture, Lee, but uh, until then, it's going to get worse for the Jews and it's going to get worse for the Christians, but. We know the end of the story, so we know it's leading to more, uh, more damage to the Jewish community. But Christians, uh, it, it's time to speak up. You know, we can't just uh, uh, the days of the days for Christians to simply say, "I love the Jewish people and I pray for the peace of Jerusalem." That's great. That's wonderful. But that's the foundation of what Christians should do. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem is is the same as praying for the return of Yeshua because. There's not going to be any peace in Jerusalem or in Israel until the Messiah, Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, returns. Uh, but right now, more than just praying for the peace of, of, of Jerusalem, Christians need to examine their hearts and see if they're ready to actually, uh, for lack of a better word, put their money where their mouth is and say, okay, you know what? 
I will reach out to my Jewish neighbor, my Jewish coworker, my Jewish schoolmate, my Jewish family member, and tell them I got your back because this is mm -hmm. this is what we are. This is this is what this is what we are, and um, and that, that's it. That's it. I know I, I sound like I'm repeating myself, but uh, um, you know, so much is coming in the news every single day now. It's uh, if Christians don't see it, uh, they're not paying attention. Now, we, we know that this is going to come to a head, too, under the Antichrist and, right. and the evil that he's going to bring. But in all that tribulation, both it's starting to build up now, but also in the tribulation in the future, is there a silver lining to that dark cloud? Well, the silver lining to the dark cloud, there is, uh, uh, th there is a... Uh, uh, Unless you're trying to lead me to something that I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about, I'm thinking of the there's a, it's a two part silver lining. Any Jewish person we can reach for Yeshua before the tribulation will be raptured with us, and that's, that's the best we can do. But at the end of the tribulation, because of the work of the uh, uh, of the sheep, the Gentiles who are actually going to be left behind. Uh, uh, they, uh, there will be some Jewish people that will survive, and those are the ones who, who are calling Yeshua. So the silver lining is that because Satan is not going to succeed, the yeah. Jews are going to, and one third of the Jews are going to survive, and they're going to call Yeshua to return. Christians need to understand that Jesus, Yeshua, is not coming back unless Israel calls him. Yeah. So, uh, so it, 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 it cannot happen that, that Satan. Uh, is, uh, is 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 completely successful. Unfortunately, he uh, he will manage uh, through the uh, the Antichrist. Uh, he'll he'll manage to do a lot of damage. Uh, you know, uh, during the tribulation. Uh, one thing that I I I I use that as hopefully as an encouragement when I, I tell people when you talk to a Jewish man, you don't know that because of the the, the 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 time that we live in. When you talk to a Jewish man right now. You could be planting a seed in the head, in the mind of one of the 144,000 Jews that will be left behind. That's an interesting thought, brother. And that should be an encouragement to talk because you could be preparing some of the greatest evangelists that will do work for Jesus, for God, during the tribulation. Well, do you have any closing thoughts or observations you'd like to make before we move into Q&A? I've, I've, I've exhausted everything I could tell you. <laughs> okay. I mean, wait, let's move into the Q&A. All right. I, I got, what time is it? Yeah, I got a few more minutes. Okay. So, I... And yeah, by the way, Lee, if I cannot answer, the question's for you. Okay. So we should have questions here in just a minute. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the uh, at the web as well. So you see them on the in the um, in the live in the, stream. Yeah, in the live stream. Yeah, I have that okay. on my uh, a question. With will the, will the four hundred forty four thousand be from all around the world? Uh, all I can tell you from scripture is there will be twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes. Beyond that, we don't know. Oh, well, beyond that, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Lee. Maybe Lee has a special uh, knowledge on that. Well, the only thing my first thought would have been that these are just twelve thousand from each of the tribes, regardless of where they are in the planet Earth. And there's also a possibility that some of them won't even know until it happens that they were descendants of Jacob. And and they might not even know, and I don't think they will know what tribe they're from. Yeah, because because the tribal record were were destroyed uh, uh, <clears throat> at the AD seventy destruction of the temple. What we know is the Levites. It's carried in the name. So Levi, Levi, Leventhal, Kohen, Kohen, Khan. All those names mean you're a Levite. But that's the only tribal record that we can trace because of the name. All the other tribes we don't know. I have no idea what tribe I'm from. And so, but they don't need to know what tribe they're from because God is going to use them, and Amen. God knows what tribe they're from. Amen. Um, how were the 144,000 going to come to know Jesus as their Messiah? Do you have an answer for that? Well, the only thing I could 
think of is they're obviously going to have to hear the gospel somehow or some way, but the means we don't know. Was it a dream? Was it a vision? Was it picking up a gospel tract? Was it any of a hundred means? Uh, we just know the that sheep? God is going to work sovereignly. Maybe it could be the sheep. That's right. The sheep could be, you know, because, because I, you know, friends, the best blessing you can give a Jewish person is the gift of the, the best gift is the gift of the gospel, the gift Amen. that never stops giving. So maybe, and, and I'm not saying it's the only women, maybe some of the sheep, some of the Gentiles who get saved after the tribul after the tribulation started, will right. want to reach out to the Jewish people and say, listen, I, I, I found Jesus. And then some of those 144,000 that God would have prepared that maybe you or me would have talked to or whatever will go like this makes sense and they become you know great evangelists I, I, I don't know all I know is that they're gonna make a difference what does the average Jew in Israel think about Christians uh, that is that is the million dollar question. Uh, I I don't even know what do you mean by an average Jew anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we should, I was going to start with that because the average Jew, where does the average Jew sit on the spectrum of Judaism from ultra orthodox to completely secular? You know, yeah. you have average Jews and and on every at every level. Um, generally speaking, Jewish people are keeping their distance when it comes to Christians. Uh, yeah. and, and, but they get to know Christians. They get to see they can trust them. That's a different story. But in Israel, uh, I you know, Israelis are more inquisitive than American Jews. And so they love to talk. It doesn't mean they agree with you. It doesn't mean they're going to buy everything you say right away. But they love to dialogue. They love to discuss things. So Israeli Jews are more real. Like, you know, they're just going to be very transparent, very open to conversation. And so if you go to Israel, you talk to Jewish people, uh, uh, they're going to want to talk. They're going to be more op open. But that, being more open doesn't mean that somebody trusts you. And always expect that Jewish people are not going to fully trust Christians. And that's mostly because of the baggage that Christians carry uh, because of 2000, uh, 2,000 years of history of anti-Semitism. That is not the baggage that belongs to you as a Christian, but by heritage. It does in the eyes of a Jew, but you did not cause it to happen. But by heritage, as a Christian, it's attached to you and you cannot ignore it. And that's why Jews might be a little distant. Are non-Jewish believers in Messiah and Jewish believers, non, let me, let me get this question straight. This is a confusing question a little bit. Do unbelievers that are Gentiles and unbelievers that are Jews, do they both have to believe in Jesus as for salvation? Say that again. Do, do Gentiles and Jews both have to believe in Jesus for salvation, or is there one way for Gentiles and another way for Jews? There is a false doctrine known as dual covenant theology. Dual covenant theology that claims that Jews, by virtue of being uh, uh, the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, it, they, they're, they're saved. Uh, they don't have to do anything. And Gentiles become Christians through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. But that again, um, that, 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 just, that, that makes John 3, 1 through 15, Nicodemus, uh, that makes it into a lie. And all scripture is, is inspired. It, it, it's, it's the truth. So there's no way, no way, the scripture says, the only way to the Father is through what? Through Jesus, the Son. Through the Son. So uh, it doesn't say the only way to the Father is through the Son for Gentiles. And for Jews, yeah, you know, they're, they're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They can use the back door. They're, you know, they're, they're good. No, the only way to the Father is through the Son for Jews and Gentiles and Muslims and everybody. It doesn't make any sense to me to think that the only way for the Gentiles to be saved would be to believe on the Jewish Messiah, who's the son of Jewish David, and then and then give a different way for the. I mean, do the, it just doesn't make sense to have two no, different ways. No, no, it's the same way for everybody. And but but uh, this being said, I like to tell people that it's the same ingredients: the gospel to the Jews and the gospel yep. to the Gentiles. It's the same ingredients. You don't add, you don't take away, but the recipe is different. 
you present it differently. Yep. That's all. Yep. And, uh, of course, in the tribulation, the, the gospel is going to be attached to the earthly promises for the kingdom. Right now, it's attached to the heavenly promises. Right. Okay, here's another interesting question. Um, in the rapture, when the dead in Christ rise, are the graves going to be physically opened like they were opened in Matthew chapter 27? That is definitely a question. Uh, oh, you froze. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you very well. Yeah. That is definitely a question that they were asking you because I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, with, w one of the only people I know that's actually been delving into this question and, and to what degree the saints are going to be uh, visible at the rapture, or if we're just going to be completely invisible, is, is Mondo. He's been... I don't know if he's come to any conclusions on it, but he's been thinking about it, been going down that path. So this is the kind of question you may want to connect with Mondo Gonzalez on because he's been looking at this, folks. Uh, personally, myself, I've tended to believe that the rapture is going to be uh, more or less kind of secretive. Uh, people are going to be aware it happened after it happened. And, and a few people are going to see people vanish. But for the most part, uh you're here, you're gone, and, and the world is left wondering where they went. But yeah. there's a few it's people not... that, yeah, there's a few people that think it might be a little more visible and they might see the saints ascend like they saw Jesus ascend. Uh yeah, I you know, it's just first the dead in Christ and then and then the, the rest of us. I, I don't think it's gonna be like the dead in Christ going up. And then those who are alive, let's say it would happen right now, you and I going like, okay, come on, you guys, okay, you're done? Okay, I'm next. It's not going to be one of those. It's in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be like them, us, and then poof, we're gone. So yep. what, people are gonna, what people are going to notice is things are no longer. They're not going to see things disappearing, I think. They're going to say, oh, they're going to, what they're going to notice is a plane flying, uh, you know, falling into the sky, a car crashing on the freeway, train crashing, uh, uh, all those things, because uh, uh, that's going to be becoming an issue. But uh, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to, they're going to see, it's going to be, it's going to happen too quick. But that's, again, the speculation. Yes. The important you... part is, the important part is not how quick it's going to happen. The important part is, are you going to be part of it? Do you believe that Jesus died for you? That's what's important. Amen. Amen. Do you think that Jewish people in America during the tribulation are going to need to be hidden? I believe that Jewish people in America before the tribulation are going to need to be hidden, which is where this is the point I've been trying to make for an hour. So, yeah. yes, I believe that right now Jews are at risk. I mean, the Jews are being hit on the street. If you were a yarmulke in some places of, of, of America or some, in some places in Europe, you take your life in your own hands. Yes, just, not just in America. All over the world, Jews are becoming a very, very, uh, a very easy target right now. Some of the videos that have come up from the last few months uh, are the bigger cities in Europe, uh, New York City, um, some other cities in America where Jews are attacked, their cars are attacked, their businesses are attacked. Right. If you had told me two years ago we were going to see this in Europe and America to that degree, I would have raised my eyebrows and been a little skeptical. Listen, Lee, uh, <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been teaching this message yeah. one way or the other since 2000. 23 years now, almost yep. 24. And when I started in 2000, I was telling people, this is what's coming, which is where we are right now. People look at me going like, Olivier, you are a conspiracy theorist. You're a nut. This is not, it's never going to get that bad until the, the second part of the tribulation. And here we are. And I wish I was wrong. Yeah. I was not. Do you think climate change exists to explain away birth pangs? No idea. Yeah, I, I think the whole climate change nonsense is just one more part of the whole, uh, the early birth pangs. Just bringing nonsense. Yeah. 
deceiving people. That's, that that's not that I, I never thought about this. No, I don't know. But yep. Does anybody know where the lost tribes are? Yes. God. Yes. To him, they're not lost. Yep. Well, you know, there's another interesting thing I've thought about it too. Is um we know that some of the tribes that were supposedly lost, we read their names, uh, the, those tribe names, in later on in, in the history of, of Israel, and some of them even in the New Testament. So it does raise a question, are, when we're talking about lost tribes, are we saying those tribes are lost entirely, or just the big segments of those tribes have been mixed and scattered and are lost out there somewhere? Well, those tribes are, cannot be lost entirely because yeah. we're going to have 12,000 of the 12 tribes during the tribulation, and God is not going to make them from yeah. scratch. They're That's going right. to be descendants of the tribe. So those tribes are not lost. They're scattered, and they're unknown to one another. They, people don't know. Like, again, I don't know what tribe I'm from, uh, and the vast majority of the Jews, except for those who have the name that connects with the word Levite, uh, don't know where they're from. Uh, but God, God, God knows that. So uh, they exist. They're somewhere in the world, and they're going to be uh, regathered into twelve thousand of each tribe during the tribulation. The rest of them, the believing Jews, will be taken before the tribulation, and uh, some will unfortunately perish during the tribulation. But they exist, and God knows who they are, and uh, that's good enough for me. And I'm ru I'm running out of time here, so I think okay. we should probably. We should probably wrap it up because uh, I think we've been doing about an hour, right? Yeah, we're right now we are about an hour and five minutes. So, yeah, see I think I, I need to. I mean, uh, I'd love to come back if you want me to come back, but I, uh, I I need to wrap this up. Sure, let's do that. So, brother, if you have any uh, closing comments or thoughts you'd like to make, uh, why don't you bring them out and then close us in a word of prayer? Uh, no, I, I, I just want to, uh, I really want to uh, remind our audience that we live in a very exciting time. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the Jewish people exist today is probably the biggest, best proof for the existence of God, because we would not exist if it was not for the grace of God. Uh, uh, they, we live in exciting time, but also challenging times. And I, I, I want to challenge uh, your Christian audience to really examine their hearts and, 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 and think, okay, I love the Jewish people. I love Israel. What can I do to make a difference? Only with the idea that if you reach out uh, and, 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 and help Jewish people, you do it because it's the right thing to do. But you, it's also going to give you a tremendous opportunity to explain why you do it and, and, and give you a platform to share the gospel. And uh, a lot has been done to help Jewish people send money to Israel, do humanitarian work, and just that. But it was once said that when you just do humanitarian work to help Jewish people, it is the same as sending a Jew to hell on the full stomach. That's an interesting point, brother. Very and Point. And so we do not want to be guilty of sending Jews to hell on a full stomach. We, I'd rather send a Jew to heaven on an empty stomach. I like that point, brother. Well, I'm just going to, before I have uh, Brother Olivier close us in prayer, I'm just going to let you know that I'm going to let Olivier go his way, but I'm going to stick around and answer the rest of the, the questions that you guys have posted. So if you want to stick around for Q&A, go ahead and stick around. But as far as our Olivier uh, time now, we're, we're going to have him close this section in prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share what he has put on my heart and uh, this great need that we have right now to come alongside the Jewish community and show them the love of Messiah. Love, Lord, thank you for the times we live in. Thank you for the promises you've made, not just to the Jewish people, but to us as believers. Uh, thank you for what's coming. We know the end of the story. We know you win. We know you win because uh, you, you sent your son to die for us. That was the first coming, but there was a second coming. And the first time he came as the Lamb of God, 
to be the sacrifice for all of us. The second time he's returning, Yeshua, you're returning as the Lion of Judah. You're going to conquer and you're going to reign from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And we look forward to that. Lord, thank you for, for uh, saving us. And I pray that you would give us many opportunities to make a difference in the lives of Jewish people, in the Jewish community, wherever we are, wherever we're listening. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother, for coming on. It's been a great joy. Um, it's tremendous discussion tonight. And you made some points that were, in my mind, vital. I really loved your clothing, closing thought on we want, we'd be better off to send a Jew to heaven on an empty stomach than to send him to hell with a full stomach. I like that point. And that yeah, applies because, to because, because we, we're still looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's going to be plenty of food anyway. That's right. <laughs> All right, brother, take care and God bless. God bless. Shalom. Okay, let's go back. I'll finish the questions here. We know that many people are going to uh, not go up in the rapture. They're going to go into the tribulation. Um, if they survive the tribulation and walk into the millennial kingdom, are we going to know them and vice versa? Well, we may not know all of them by name until we're introduced to them, but we will be able to know them and um, and they will get to know us. Where do you think this war in Israel will end up in regards to Bible prophecy? Well, obviously this war is taking Israel and the entire region in the direction of well, setting the stage for the Psalm 83 war, setting the stage for Ezekiel 38 and 39, whether these things are going to accelerate to that point here in the next year or in the next three, four years, it's hard to tell. But they're de definitely going in that direction, definitely setting the geopolitical chessboard up for that final set of wars. Okay, one of the questions was, Olivier, do you know where your Jewish lineage goes to in which tribe? And um, no, he does not know which tribe he, he, he comes from. Um, if he has a guess, um, that would only be a guess. Um, Olivier, do you feel a tug to return to Israel to live? Um, I wish I had noticed that question in time to ask him. My apologies. Um, that would be really good to know. Has anti-Semitism increased? Um, absolutely, it's been on the increase in the last few decades. It's gone from being uh, something that's in a pockets of extreme left liberals and, and, uh, and of course, uh, militant Muslims who have the jihad path and the anti-Israel path. But it's been spreading broadly in so it's leavening all of society. It's even leavening circles that historically were some sort of conservative Christianity. And does it mean that we are closer to the rapture? Well, only in this sense. I think increasing anti-Semitism is indeed one of the signs of the last days. It's one of the points of prophetic convergence. Okay, here's a question on the sheep and goats. Do the sheep and goats go through the millennium? The sheep, well, let me put it this way. At the second coming, when the Son of Man comes in glory and he destroys the ungodly at Armageddon, he cleans the world of all the ungodly. Part of that cleaning of the ungodly is the separation of the sheep and goats, which you read about in Matthew 25. The Lord is going to set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. The sheep are going to be able to go into the thousand-year kingdom, and the goats are going to be executed. We read the execution part in, in the Gospel of Luke, and they'll be cast into hell. So the goats are not going to go into the thousand years. However, those sheep that go into the millennium, they are going to have children. They're going to repopulate the earth, and some of those children 
are going to grow up ungodly and unsaved. Uh, and then when we come to the great white throne judgment after the thousand years, that's going to be all the ungodly from the entire history of the world are going to be raised from the dead and stand before God Almighty at the great white throne judgment and give account for their ungodliness because their name is not in the book of life. They're going to be judged on the basis of the book of works. And everybody judged on the basis of the book of works is going to wind up in eternal punishment. So if you've never settled this question, folks, if you've never dealt with the Lord Jesus, put your trust in him and gotten your name in the Lamb's book of life, make sure you do this. This is the one thing that you need to have to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. What is the significance of Jesus arri arriving on two mules instead of one? I understand the meaning of royalty attributed to riding the mule, but why were there two instead of one? Off the top of my head, I'm not really aware of why there, there, if there was two, why there would be two. I'm just aware of the fact that the Lord Jesus was riding on the foal. Um, but maybe someone else has a good answer for that question. Okay, got a few more questions here. Oh, maybe we already got some of these questions. Yes, this list has already been answered. Okay, so there we are. We've gotten all of the questions answered. I want to thank you all once again for showing up to another Soothkeep live stream. Apologize for the technical difficulties we had the first 30 minutes. That was really bizarre. The the whole that whole first time that when the we were getting not only a double echo but a triple echo, that was really bizarre. We had to shut it down. I had to delete that live stream, set up a new live stream and start all over from scratch. And then that second live stream, we were still having video and audio problems. So I had to tinker with it and tweak it and we eventually got it to go. But wow, that was that was bizarre. But it, it is interesting, as Olivier has pointed out, when you deal with the Israel issue and the anti-Semitism, the fallen spirits just pull out all the stops and they go after the work of God like there's no tomorrow. It kind of reminds me of what happens when L.A. Marzulli speaks on the Nephilim and the cover-up of the whole Nephilim thing that that the, um, the deep state and the global cabal are involved in. Anyway, it's part of spiritual warfare. And whenever we start touching on some of the things that really come down to the issues of the last day, the devil's going to get angry. But anyway, I thank you for your patience. I thank you for showing up. And and I do want to thank my moderators once again. You, you girls and uh, guys do an outstanding job, and I'm so very thankful for you. So I just want to give you all my love. I I just it's it's amazing uh, blessing to have fellowship with you all to be able to encourage you all and to be encouraged by you guys. I do appreciate the encouraging comments you make on the YouTube videos and you send me in the emails. It's a tremendous blessing. Um, may we all just keep looking up, press onwards, press upwards, and keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus until that rapture trumpet sounds. So take care, everyone, and have a good evening, uh, and I'll see you next time.